infantrymen, for those that are in combat, it's very hard for them sometimes to articulate what they experienced. They go through a whole series of emotions. Joy, elation, horror, fear. What literary genre allows you to portray that better than poetry? I, I don't know. That's why I think poetry is so important. Many have said that it's very hard to articulate that experience, and I think poetry gives you probably the only way that you can uh, deliver uh, all of those feelings simultaneously. Ratchet and the weasel and I are behind this paddy dyke, and Victor Charlie's giving us what for. And Ratchet, he lifts his head just a little, but just enough for the round to go in one brown eye, and I swear to Christ out the other. And he starts thrashing and bleeding and screaming and trying to get the top of his head to stay on. But we have to keep shooting. A B-40 tunnels into the dike and blows the weasel against me. He doesn't get the chance to decide if he should give up and die. Now I'm crying and I'm screaming medic, but I have to keep shooting. At this point, I always wake and big black Jerome and little white William, my brothers, are not dying beside me even though I can still smell their blood, even though I can still see them lying there. You see, these two, they've been taking turns dying on me again and again and again for all these long years. And still people tell me, forget Nam. I don't believe that the metaphor of the brotherhood of arms is strong enough. In combat, men become each other's mothers. We are talking about a clicking in of some very deep emotional mechanisms that bond soldiers to each other. And the grief that a soldier feels when a comrade is killed or severely maimed is akin to the grief of a mother whose child has just been killed. My father was a paratrooper in D-Day in World War II. And like many men after the war, when we were victorious, he arrived back home and was thought of as a war hero. He was a war hero, and then the rest of his life, he suffered from being a war hero. California Poppy, I was crying for you. You brought me a California poppy in the scented warmth under the eucalyptus. My father suffered from combat trauma, something that did not have a name then. So he drank a lot, he fought a lot, he was unable to hold down a job, and the marriage ended when I was quite young. You knelt beside me and let your eyes be my eyes to the bottom of the earth. Was that the look we held that later was no more? He died at the age of 53, walking home from a tavern he was found in a snowdrift the following day. Come back, moment in the grass. Come back, momentary father. The reality of combat is nothing like the image I think many of us carry into combat. First of all, there's the factor of fear, which is overpowering in situations where uh, violent death is all around you. Fear is something which um, you have a constant second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour battle to control. And you always have moments in which fear takes control, in which you fail, in which your instincts towards self-preservation uh, make you crumble. Although we see very graphic images of violence presented to us by the entertainment industry, we taste a bit of war's exhilaration and its perverse thrill without tasting that fear. Uh, we learn that we're not the people we thought we were. We have images, all of us, I think, of heroics, of being able to do uh, 
noble deeds under duress. And um, we find that fear is so pervasive that oftentimes carrying out just very basic functions is very difficult. You know, we didn't want to, to have to be part of that war. Uh, and, and given that, that we were put there, it wasn't like it wasn't like we were going out and causing harm to people because we wanted to. It was just the more efficiently, the faster, the more, uh, the better aim we had while killing people, more likely the faster we'd get to go home, which is what we wanted to do. Break a leg, his foot torn off at the ankle, half wrapped in corrugated iron, held the promise of a gift. Jesus smiled sadly from the photo taped to his gun's stock. Blood, like the rain, soaked everything. The medic, impotent, suspicious, like God, lied. The poem Break a Leg comes from two places. There are several photographs taken by actually an American photographer from Life magazine who was murdered and uh, never came back from the Biafran War. And there's a, uh, there is a photograph he took of a young soldier who has no leg holding an AK-47 with a photograph of uh, Jesus taped to the gun stock. So that was part of that came from, but also that I have an uh, an older relative who fought in the war, he was 12 years old as a soldier, and his, uh, his whole foot was torn off uh, by a claymore mine. War, contention between people. This is how we begin. Specific conflicts, armed hostilities. The art of war, well, it's certainly not a science, is it? But doesn't art create strategy and tactics? Been in the wars, war baby, war bride, war crime, that which violates the international laws of war, as if laws are effective in wartime. War cry, war of attrition, War of nerves, war grave. War weary, just hearing the words. These cadets know that uh, they might be in combat pretty quickly after they graduate. So they want to know. They want to get as much information as they possibly can. And poetry provides us uh, a great vehicle to uh, teach the cadets, as much as, as anyone can, what that combat is like. Drive a rendezvous with death at midnight in some blazing town when spring trips north again this year. And I, to my pledge, word am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. We all, of course, now volunteer uh, for the Army. There's no draft anymore. There hasn't been for a while. And it's not particularly pleasant that we have to go through these things. Now that it's a peacekeeping mission, it's even less pleasant. And Alan Seeger's rendezvous with death, as well as anything, describes how I feel about my duty to go over there. Uh, it, it, it's very much that I, to my pledge, word am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. Rage, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carry feasts for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin, muse. The Iliad is the earliest full comprehensive account of battle. You have the violent hand-to-hand -hand combat which is described with uh, uh, terrible 
false. I mean, the, the account of, of spears going through a brain and what actually then happens, how the brain spatters the shield of the man who's thrown the spear, and so on, is very, very graphic. Poets are unpredictable. Plato banned them from his Republic. He thought they were troublemakers. The thing about poets is they're always the first to, bre you know, to broach a subject or to dare to say something. They break taboos. That's what they do in society. The wind was tired from carrying the coffins. It leaned against a palm tree. A satellite inquired, where to now? The silence in the wind's cane murmured, Baghdad, and the palm tree caught fire. In January 2003, Laura Bush invited poets from around the country to a gathering at the White House to honor Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, and Langston Hughes. Poets Against the War began when Laura Bush invited Sam Hamill to the White House. I also received an invitation from Laura Bush to attend a symposium on American voices. Sam invited 50 of his closest friends to use the occasion to speak out against the administration's policies that seem to be leading us to war. I think they thought that we could actually go to the White House and they could do their little presentation to honor Walt Whitman and Langston Hughes and Emily Dickinson without any political fallout. It's a stupid, naive, virtually illiterate way of thinking. Anybody who's ever read Whitman or Langston Hughes knows that these were uh, men who were outspoken in their, devo in their devotion to uh, our Constitution, to the democracy, and to human dignity. All of those things have enormous political implication. They were overtly political poets. And Emily Dickinson was a divinely political poet in a subtle way. My portion is defeat today, a paler luck than victory. Less paeans, fewer bells. The drums don't follow me with tunes. Defeat, a somewhat slower means, more arduous than balls. Tis populous with bone and stain and men too straight to stoop again. And piles of solid moan and chips of blank and boyish eyes, and scraps of prayer and death's surprise, stamped visible in stone. Whitman, I mean, in every way, stands at the gate of modern poetry. He's one of the first poets, I think, to, uh, to give a, a full and rich and moving expression to the cost of warfare. The neck of the cavalryman with the bullet through and through I examine. Hard the breathing rattles, quite glazed already the eye, yet life struggles hard. Come, sweet death, be persuaded, O oh, beautiful death, in mercy, come quickly. And he writes with tremendous compassion. And Compassion was not a note often heard in poems about war before. I can't imagine how they could imagine a symposium about the poetry of Langston Hughes, especially, which didn't at some point become political. Langston Hughes was a very political poet. We will take you and kill you, expendable. We will fill you full of lead, expendable. And when you're dead, in the nice cold ground, we'll put your name above your head, if your head can be found.
we must choose between a world of fear and a world of progress. We cannot stand by and do nothing while dangers gather. We must stand up for our security and for the permanent rights and the hopes of mankind by heritage and by choice. The United States of America will make that stand. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. But since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Tonight, Americans and Asians are dying for a world where each people may choose its own path to change. This is the principle for which our ancestors fought in the valleys of Pennsylvania. It is the principle for which our sons fight tonight in the jungles of Vietnam. When a country prepares for war and goes into war, there is a kind of collective euphoria or madness that takes over the population. And what happens in wartime is that the state and the media gives us the language by which we articulate the experience we're undergoing. You know, countdown with Iraq, showdown with Iraq, all these kinds of cliches and aphorisms seep their way into our language so that even when we have a kind of disquiet about what's going on, um, we're trapped because it's those cliches and aphorisms um, we, we use in order to try and explain our experience. We lose sight of our humanity, our limitations, um, our poverty, uh, and, and believe that we are able to know the all overarching truth. Then we lose something fundamental to all ethics, I think. I think the role of poets is to remind us of our humanity. I think um, poetry takes us back to the center of who we are as human beings. In the midst of preparing a big event in San Francisco to honor the life and work of Kenneth Ruxroth, the great poet, I took a little break and ran to the post office to get my mail. And there was a large cream-colored square envelope with the White House in gold in the upper left-hand corner. I knew what it was because there's no other reason I would get anything like that from the White House. And I felt queasy. It was more about how best to respond, in what way to say no. Should I simply write a polite letter and decline, or should I speak from my conscience? I really felt that I had to make my position known and to state it pretty clearly that I would invite my fellow poets to stand beside me as, as many as, as wished to because I invited poets to speak from their conscience. Poets tend to be humanists and they tend to, to see things from angles that other people don't pause long enough to look at. And I sent the letter off to about three dozen friends and the poems began coming in and the word began going out. Sam sent me an email and said, I'm going to the White House and I want to present some poems uh, against the war because it's impossible for me to just stand up and uh, pretend that this war is not uh, going forward and is not going on. And I want to make some sort of statement on uh, behalf of all the people in the nation, and I want the poets to be able to do it. Fill the air with poems so thick, even bombs can't fall through.
snow, so fluffy and soft. I like to run and jump into it. It leads to peace and love. Snow stops war and fights that lead to killing. So snow, come today. The poem in time of war should wake the city shouting, extra, extra. Then whisper the story behind the story like a conspirator. It should be short and stirring as the president's call to arms. Soft enough for a flag at half mast, strong enough to stiffen the bereaved, spacious enough to serve as a body bag. The poem should carry the news that men die miserably for lack of. It is a brief on behalf of the living, a paper megaphone for the voices of the dead. It must be the world's last will and testament, a listing of what will be left. It steals from forebears, Sassoon's doom diary, and Auden's call to love. Who are the good guys now? Who are the bad? Nobody's wearing Stetsons, black or white. Each has a history of evil deeds, one individual, one centuries of rapine and ideals. It's almost noon. One leader straps on bombs. The armies mass. We'll, we'll blow, blow that, that SOB, SOB to kingdom come, come everyone, everyone thinks. Bring on Armageddon. Armageddon. Yosemite Sam, frustrated and enraged, jumps up and down, shooting holes in the clouds. And Africa is dying out of AIDS. Why the hell doesn't the moving finger write? What the hell are you waiting for, my God? Why don't you tell those bastards not to fight? For, for Pete's, Pete's sake, sake send, send an, an angel. angel. Burn a bush. I thought we would have a few hundred poems because all of the major poets of, of the United States oppose this administration in various ways. But within about 36 hours, we had 1,500 entries. The email site basically collapsed from overload. I, at that point, was traveling across the country and called in a couple days after I received the invitation for Laura Bush and said, how's it going? And he said, help, I need some help. Sam asked if I would help set up an infrastructure, a technological infrastructure on the web so that those voices could be heard. In fact, the entire poetry uh, website, Poets Against War, was just on a laptop that a friend of mine carried around. Well, my mom said, do you want to come see your poem? And I said, yes. And she came up and she showed it to me and I just paused for a minute because I was thinking, Wow, I'm actually on a computer. My poem is actually in there, and what will happen, and will it, will it, where will it go, and who will find it, and will ac people actually read it? At the same time Poets Against the War was getting started, we were already busy here in England. Uh, I decided to email 100 poets. Some of them were in Ireland, some were in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, really all around the world, India as well. and. I just asked them to, to send me poems uh, with their feelings about what was happening. Death is easy to pronounce. He deserved to die. He ought to be shot. Hanging's too good for him. The words fall glib. Throw away lines sentencing them to death. Distant observer, you speak without guilt. Or fear of misplaced allegiances. You just need something to say, that's all. The right sentiment, rightly declared. Whichever way your loyalties blow in the gust of the smoke-filled air, a country burns. The death dealers deserve to die, you say. Death is easy to pronounce. It's the smell of burning children that's hard. This wasn't a dentist's against the war experience. This wasn't a zoologist's against the war or surgeons or policemen. This was a poets against the war movement. It was uh, originally uh, generated by uh, people that write poetry, they get excited about poetry, that just happen to communicate on the internet, and it spread. Laura Bush, 
and we think hearing some kind of news about what was happening in response to her invitation canceled the event and she canceled it very quickly the symposium's cancellation drew intense media attention by that time poets against the war had thousands and thousands of poems we wanted those voices to be heard poets against the war put out a call for readings to happen on february 12th we put out the call and Hundreds of readings were organized all over the world in little tiny towns in New Mexico, in Washington State, in Ohio, and we would keep getting emails from people. They felt a sense of connection that they too could join, not just by submitting poems, but by organizing readings in their communities. Poetry's role in expressing the heroism and the horror of war is nothing new. It's as old as poetry itself. God of war, with your fierce wings you slice away the land and charge disguised as a raging storm. Like a fiery monster you fill the land with poison. You are blood rushing down a mountain, spirit of hate, greed, and anger, dominator of heaven and earth. Your fire wafts over our land, riding on a beast. You decide all fate, you triumph over all our rights. Who can explain why you go on so? Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not that the soldier knew. Someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not a reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. And the, the courage was just extraordinary. But the blunder was extraordinary. And Tennyson's poem captures the futility, the blunder, the wastage. By the time of the First World War, the means available for war had overwhelmed and grown beyond any conceivable purpose for which the war might be fought. If you were going to fight a great power war, then necessarily it was going to be a war of millions of men facing one another with artillery, with tanks. That is what a war was going to be if you were going to fight one at that time. And that was the tragedy of the First World War. And that was why so many millions had died. It was because of this transformation that had occurred in the character of warfare. The armies on each side were just thrown into this gap where they were chewed up. It was a zone of absolute horror, but in a rather limited area. Uh, and it was a, a war of horror for soldiers, much more than it, for civilians. At the beginning of the 20th century, the idea of the war poet was not an anti-war poet. The, the war poet was someone who was in the war, probably an officer who had been educated at Cambridge or Oxford, with these very refined sensibilities. These were not 20th century poets uh, up until the moment that they experienced these bombardments and this, this horrific mass slaughter. Sassoon was a decorated soldier, a man of, of legendary courage. He was known as Mad Jack because of his, uh, uh, his bombing exploits. He used to go out um, at night uh, on patrol with a pocket full of hand grenades and throw them at the enemy and, and then come back again. But Sassoon's poems deliver a tremendous sort of shock. Does it matter, losing your legs? For people will always be kind, and you need not show that you mind when the others come in after hunting to gobble their muffins and eggs. Does it matter, losing your sight? There's such splendid work for the blind, and people will always be kind as you sit on the terrace remembering and turning your face to the light. 
World War I, uh, particularly with the British poets, um, I think we see that they were brought up in a very romantic era. Uh, their concept of war was uh, built on the uh, 17 and 1800s where uh, battles were fought one-on-one -on -one with dignity, and they found themselves in trenches uh, confronted with modern technology, concertina, machine guns, uh, things that they had not expected, and the war was long and drawn out. Sassoon made this public protest. He wrote to his commanding officer saying, I am a soldier, speaking for soldiers, and I must protest that the war on which I entered as a war of uh, defense has now become a war of aggression and conquest. I am making this statement as an act of willful defiance of military authority. I am a soldier. I have seen and endured the sufferings of the troops, and I can no longer be a party to prolong these sufferings for ends which I believe to be evil and unjust. I suppose it's not unthinkable that he could have been court-martialed and shot for that. But he was a, he was a he was something of a hero because of his he had the military cross, he had a medal, the public knew him. The government were, were severely embarrassed by this. Sassoon was whisked away to Edinburgh, a long way from London, and sent to a military hospital called Craig Lockhart, which was a hospital for people suffering from shell shock. Sassoon was rather bored by uh, newcomers. He didn't really want to meet anybody else while he was at Craig Lockhart. He was ashamed of being there anyway. He felt he was a failure. He felt he'd been silenced by authority and he shouldn't have given in. So he wasn't terribly enthusiastic when Owen knocked on his door, but Owen, on the other hand, was immensely excited to meet a published poet. And they did eventually become close friends, very close friends, I think, and they found they had a great deal in common. Wilfred Owen came from a lower middle class background, four children uh, to be brought up, so there was never any spare cash around. Owen was a committed poet from his late teens onwards. He was a great admirer of Keats and, he, uh, and other romantics, Wordsworth in particular, and he knew from them that to be a poet was the greatest calling that anybody could possibly have, and he had never had any doubt that that's what he wanted to be. He was sent out to France at the beginning of 1917, and within three weeks he was in one of the most appalling circumstances one could possibly imagine, uh, when he was sent into a German dugout in, in uh, no man's land that had recently been captured as a British outpost. And he had to keep his platoon there for 50 hours, he says, under constant shell fire, expecting at any minute to be buried alive. The place was slowly flooding with rainwater, with the water rising above their knees, so that at any moment they might have been buried or drowned or just died of shock. They were then taken out for a short period, uh, put back in again in a quite different situation on the top of a hill in very hard frost. So it had been heavy rain and mud, but now it was bitter frost and they were out on the snow, exposed, unable to move. And one man in his platoon froze to death and he was eventually almost killed by a shell that dropped near his head while he was asleep and he was blown into the air, and that finally broke his nerve. In World War I, it was called shell shock. In World War II, it was called combat neurosis. And now it's called post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's all the same phenomenon. There will always be psychological injuries in war, just like there are always physical injuries. And the historical record is that they rise and fall together. What spills blood spills spirit. I, I don't believe that the trauma of, of combat ever goes away, uh, whether you win or lose the war. You know, uh, my father used to wake up at night. I know plenty of World War II vets, the last good war, the, the war we won, the war that, that, that saved the whole world. I know plenty of them that still wake up nights. Uh, you don't go through things that are that, are that unnatural, that are that unholy. Uh, you don't go through them unchanged. Now, Wilfred Owen was already at Craig Lockhart, and he was suffering from shell shock. Sassoon, in a sense, undertook the, the tutelage of Owen. It was a wonderful good fortune of Owen's that he should have met Sassoon when he did because Sassoon showed him how to find his own voice and to find his own subject. 
I saw his round mouth's crimson deepen as it fell, like a sun in his last deep hour. Watch the magnificent recession of farewell, clouding half gleam, half glower, and a last splendor burn the heavens of his cheek, and in his eyes the cold stars lighting, very old and bleak, in different skies. People who have been through heavy fighting where many people have died seem to carry a kind of imprint of death on them where the dead are more real to them than the living. Owen speaks of such people as the men whose minds the dead have ravaged. Above all, I am not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. All a poet can do today is warn. That is why true poets must be truthful. He had to go back to the front to bear witness. And he says in one of his letters, um, I came out to lead these boys as well as an officer can. Um, and to watch their sufferings that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. And so he goes back so that he can testify to the horrors of the war. And I think he went knowing he wouldn't come back. They were trying to throw a pontoon bridge over a canal, and the Germans' machine guns were about 30 yards away. And these chaps were just carrying their pontoons, putting them in the river, and Owen went backwards and forwards between them, saying, you're doing very well, my boy. Just move that little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. You're doing very well, you're doing very well. And then he was hit and killed. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm hit, he said, and died. Whether he vainly cursed or prayed indeed, the bullets chirped in vain, vain, vain. Machine guns chuckled, tut, 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 and the big gun guffawed. Another sighed, oh, mother, mother. Dad, then smiled at nothing, childlike, being dead. And the lofty shrapnel cloud leisurely gestured, fool, and the splinters spat and tittered. My love, one moaned. Love languid seemed his mood, till slowly lowered his whole face kissed the mud, and the bayonet's long teeth grinned. Rabbles of shells hooted and groaned. As the bells were ringing for the armistice in Shrewsbury, where his parents lived, their front doorbell rang, bringing the telegram saying that he was killed. I think Wilfred Owen is uh, uh, probably the archetype of uh, a poet who uh, comes in with a romantic feeling and just recoils at that horror. Um, and probably writes the, the best war poetry of World War I. I don't think there's another poet of the Great War to, to equal him. True poets must be truthful. On the day that the symposium was supposed to happen, on February 12th, I organized a group of poets from the Washington, D.C. area. I began just with one poet who called another poet who called another poet. It is our hope and conviction that the true American voice, conveyed in part and without historical precedent by the poets of this country, may help to avert a disaster of tragic proportions. So we gathered in front of the White House to read our poems. It was an extremely cold, windy day. Um, s some very distinguished poets from Washington, D.C. joined us. We felt that it was important that even though the symposium had been canceled, that we raise our voices in front of the White House. Vigil for comrades swiftly slain. Vigil I never forget how as day brightened, I rose from the chill ground and folded my soldier well in his blanket and buried him 
where he fell. It was a very snowy night. There was something like two feet of snow on the ground at that time, and they got several thousand people to come and listen to poets read their poems. There was a very lively and feisty uh, atmosphere. All of you here tonight on this beautiful snowy evening, welcome to Poets Not Fit for the White House. Clubs call sheep herder coffee. I used to like sheep herder coffee, a cup of grounds in my old enameled pot, then three cups of water in a fire, and when it's hot, boiling into froth, a half cup of cold water to bring the grounds to the bottom. It was strong and bitter and good as I squatted on the river bank under the great redwoods all those years ago. Some days, it was nearly all I got. I was happy with my dog and cases of books and my funky truck. But when I think of that posture now, I can't help but think of Palestinians huddled in their ruins, the Afghani shepherd with his bleeding goats, the widow weeping, sending off her sons, the Tibetan monk who can't go home. There are fewer names for coffee than for love. Squatting, they drink, thinking, waiting for whatever comes. Your angry God craving the sacrifice of virgin generations, sons degenerate. Your holy books written in red ink on burning sands. Your prayers between rounds do no more than fasten the fate of your children to the hammered truth of your trigger. A truth that mushrooms its darkened cloud over the rest of us so that we too bear witness to the short-lived fate of a civilization that worships a male God. We have to stop speaking in codes, cultural damage, Collateral damage is code for thousands of people being killed who were powerless to change their rulers. Six lines by a hero of mine. He's a visionary. His name is Cameron Penny, and he is in the fourth grade. He is. He's amazing. He's in the fourth grade in a Michigan school. Cameron Penny wrote this. He said, if you are lucky in this life, a window will appear on a battlefield between two armies. And when the soldiers look into the window, they don't see their enemies. They see themselves as children. And they stop fighting and go home and go to sleep. <laughs> when they wake up, the land is well again. This poem that I'm going to read next was submitted to the website by Pamela Hale, as far as we know, her first published poem. She is 35 years old from Houston, Texas, and she writes, I'm an ordinary person from an ordinary place. I wanted it to be understood that it wasn't just crazy left-wing people who were against the war, and it wasn't just people who you know, were activists or people who, you know, had a had an agenda or something. It was ordinary people in ordinary places. I'm sorry that your mom was killed when a missile struck your home. You were only three and innocent. Your mother, too, was innocent. That missile came in my name, paid for by my tax dollars. I was against the bombing, but not registered to vote, afraid to take a stand. I have a daughter about your age. She is beautiful and strong. Her mother is here, her father there, but her home has never been bombed. She makes flyers to take to school that say, no one should die for oil. She scares her teachers and school counselor. She's too young to vote, but not afraid to take a stand. This time, I will not stand idly by while politicians propagandize and big corporations divvy up the booty in advance. No. no. This time I will make my voice heard. 
say the things I couldn't say before. Support my daughter and the others when they stand against another unjust war. Increasingly in the Second World War, with, with total war, you get the impact on civilians. From the First World War, with its dominant image of the trench, you move to the Second World War, which, if it has a comparable image, is the image of the fire from heaven, the bomb. There was a dehumanizing uh, that was going on. In fact, some of the poems uh, go back to the pilots when they're resting back in England, and uh, they reflect on what they've done and the horrors of what they've done. Randall Jarrell in Losses uh, writes, we read our mail and counted up our missions. In bombers named for girls, we burned the cities we had learned about in school till our lives wore out our bodies lay among the people we had killed and never seen. Hiroshima announced the possibility of the end of the world. Although it's true that many cities had been destroyed by so-called conventional bombing before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it was impossible uh, to imagine previously that every city in the world could be so destroyed. But the minute Hiroshima was destroyed, it became perfectly obvious to every thinking person that if one bomb could destroy one city, then it wouldn't take very many bombs to destroy every city on Earth. And indeed, during the Cold War, uh, those numbers were quickly achieved uh, and quickly surpassed. In madness, a woman cries, I left my child in the flames. Now all I have is my own life. I wonder if there is an operation that removes memories. Where is a cure for my pain-filled heart? You entered into the paradoxical situation that the United States and the other nuclear powers began to rely for their safety on the ability and retaliation to absolutely annihilate the civilian population of the other side. At the Strategic Air Command, they called it nation killing, which is a livelier phrase for what we call genocide. At the same time, and this is the paradox of the whole strategy, uh, the purpose of having that ability was to never have to use it. Once nuclear weapons were introduced into the picture, you could no longer settle your political disputes with warfare because it simply meant mutual annihilation. So the result was paralysis. It was, it was more than a revolution in warfare, it was the end of warfare at that level, simply the end of it. Since the Second World War, war has largely been against civilians. I mean, there's roughly three dozen wars going on around the globe at any one time. Real images of war are very carefully sanitized. Massive, powerful weapons of terror are unleashed not only on troops, but on civilians. And that has become the characteristic of modern warfare. 
civilians are the primary victims now of war. We don't hear enough about war from the perspective of the victims. And the only way to understand war is to understand it through the eyes of the victims. The conflict in Colombia started a very long time ago, more than 50 years ago. I'm very close to my brother. Pedro is his name, Pedro Villamil. He just went out one day, like anybody else, never came back. Going back to Colombia after the disappearance of my brother was not only asking about my brother Pedro, but it was asking, oh, where is Julieta? Where is Chaparro? Where is Juan? Where is Maria? Where is Marlene? Where is... I was afraid to ask. We realized it was just a whole generation. In that poem, my name is Pedro. He becomes a symbol of all the people disappeared in Central and South American countries. Letter to the brother that went to war. What can I tell you, dear brother? Mutilated in silence. You disappear as so many of my brothers with rigorous synchronicity. The dripping of the clock coagulates my eyes. Between brows and eye corner glances, I keep an ash that repels the fire that doesn't find your bones. A tomb I know by heart butchers my hands. With the only effort I have left, I write these lines while outside and around us, everything collapses and bleeds. There was a moment when it felt like maybe poets and the millions of people marching in the street might have an impact. So it was a very heady time in that way as well, not only personally, but seeing friends and, and colleagues and comrades around the world coming together and actually making a difference. What happened is that we presented for history a record of bearing witness and of standing up to authority and we proved that at a critical time uh, in Western civilization's history, there are still millions of people with a conscience who don't think that wars need to be fought unless they're absolutely necessary. killed. One had his head blown off, the other one had a, a big hole in his side. One guy was actually blown right out of his vehicle. The other one pretty much was um, killed and splattered over the rest of the people that were in his truck. They were surrounded. Fires coming from all sorts of directions. And we all thought we might make it out of here. It looked very, very close. I saw soldiers running into these burning trucks full of ammunition popping off. These are tank rounds. These are large-scale ammunition, much of it radioactive. It's depleted uranium, but when it burns, it cooks off, and you've got radiation going up into the air everywhere. And this is a few hundred feet away from me. People actually running into these burning trucks trying to save them. Innocent families who are trying to get out of a war-type situation, trying to flee, try to get to a safer place, would get caught in the middle of a battle. And they always lost. They always got blown up. My priority uh, was making sure my guys got home safe. You know, my priority was not making 100% sure that every engagement was clean and I never got in trouble, uh, whether or not it cost, you know, my guys uh, life or limb. My decision-making process was, are these guys threatening my men? Maybe. You know, well, you got you to protect the force. In modern warfare, as I saw in Iraq, people don't die like they do on television or in the movies. You don't see people get hit with a weapon, have a big red spot, and fall down. People explode. Arms come off, heads come off. 
torsos are severed, they just explode. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. The United States and our allies have prevailed. News from Iraq. Mars's bloodshot gaze considers the peace. More soldiers killed than during the war. suicide bombing, the mortars out of the back of pickup trucks instead of regular, you know, track vehicles. Um, those are all things that make it harder for me to distinguish who's the bad guy. And that made it very tense for, for everybody. And it, on top of the fact that, that four guys in our battalion had been destroyed by a car bomb by some, you know, guy asking for help in a taxi cab, um, really put us on edge the whole time. Turn around. Kneel down. Kneel down. I am happy, of course, very happy that Saddam Hussein is gone, because I'm back among friends, writers, poets, and artists whom I have not seen for a very long time. My experience with the past regime was terrible indeed. Like the fascist in Germany, the secret police burned my books, my pictures, and my poetry. This poem about uh, the killer of Iraq, about Saddam Hussein, and about my country, about Iraq. A man walks by, trips on his shadow, thinking it was stone. A lady walks by, leans down to pick up a star, thinking she found some money. Poetry comes upon words, painting them with color and decorating them with beads. A killer comes upon Iraq, thinking that he can plunge it like a sword, wherever he pleases. Life in Iraq after the occupation is becoming worse. What happened is that the American army didn't just destroy Saddam's regime, but destroyed the Iraqi government, which was established in 1921. We used to hear a long time ago that Americans never had a civilization, that they were just cowboys. When we saw them here in Iraq and were able to communicate with them, we found out that they have no sense of civilization, that they really are just cowboys and very disorganized people. Rockets destroying a happy family. Rockets fill my heart and head. Time is running by. All your friends are being blamed for this, O oh, Iraq. These are dreams. Barbed wire crowds the streets, 
and people are entangled by it and get lost in between. I tried to slip through all this chaos. I saw a family trying to climb a truck, and I saw a child with eyes full of tears behind a tank, and I saw a coffin waiting beside the Euphrates bank. Life has no meaning anymore, just tons of metal and iron. Are all these arms just for me, for my children, my old home? What war is about is the glorification of death. Death of the comrade, death for the country, sacrifice for the nation, paying the ultimate sacrifice. Once we sacrifice all before the god of war, um, we become in the service of death, not life. And that ultimately is what war demands of us. It's called food for thought, 3 a.m. They moved in unison like dancers in a ballet, the spider 20 inches from my rifle, the Viet Cong 20 feet farther out, in line, each slowly sliding a leg forward. I let the man take one more step so as not to kill the bug. What I tried to do there was give you this vision of, of looking down my rifle, you know, and give you the feeling of how hard-hearted I was at the time that I could put this spider's life up above this, really my contemporary, you know? Um, he may have been my enemy, but I'm sure he was a 19-year-old kid too, you know? I think combat is a one-way door. I think once someone's in that and witnesses it and participates in it especially, um, I think you never come back. I don't think you possibly can. It's, you're, in, you're altered. If you look at human history, war has been part of our landscape from the beginning. We as a country are the largest arms exporters on the face of the earth. We export two or three times more weapons than all the other countries combined. And flooding countries that lack stability with weapons are a major cause of the prolonged conflicts that countries have been suffering from for years. There are many powerful institutions and forces at work behind the scenes, beyond public scrutiny, uh, that bear a great deal of responsibility for the horrific bloodletting that has been going on and continues to go on in various parts of the globe that we very rarely focus on or, or acknowledge. The ethnic wars of the 20th century were primarily wars against civilians. There's very little fighting between um, the combatants. Civilians in modern war serve as either victims or adjuncts of the war effort. Civilians are pawns and seen as a kind of collateral in wartime. Over the course of time, the government of Nigeria changed tactics and began to use hunger as a way to win the war. And all the, the, the planes bringing food and medical supplies were being shot down. They were killing all the Red Cross officials. And so essentially what happened is that Biafrans began to starve to death. And in the process of that three-year war, over three million children starved to death that have been accounted for. We can't begin to talk about those who the bodies were never found. Stab at Mater, through gaps in trees, Moonlight, veins night, with the remembrance of dawn. Among ferns stubbling the forest floor, a mother squats, watching the child in her arms, losing its grip on life, its hacking breath of suffering hanging on. Gently, she closes her eyes as her fingers pincer its nose and mouth, easing the passage across. 
When I was torn by war, I took a brush immersed in death and drew a window on war's wall. I opened it, searching for something, but all I saw was another war and a mother weaving a shroud for the dead man still in her womb. We live in a very bleak world, so that's, that's how it affects me personally. And, you know, so you can't escape it in a way. And it, it's very bloody, and the bloodiness is showing in the writing and in the tone, a very, a very sad tone. Wearing faces, stand down, guard duty on the bunker line, weed wrapping about the last operation. Then someone said, you remember when that little dude got blown away in that shit storm of RPGs? Then someone cried and none of us could hold it. For a while afterwards, it seemed easier for us to act like we were men. Poetry became one of the ways that I tried to sort things out in my head to try to stay sane, to try to make some sense out of, out of what was going on around me. And once I got home, uh, it became even more so. Uh, if, uh, if something woke me up in the middle of the night, some, some remembrance of, of a man's death or whatever, I would sit and I'd think about it and I'd write about it and try to almost exercise the ghost. If you can do that, you not only uh, create something that's better than, than this terrible remembrance, uh, you also bring some credit and some justice and some, and some remembrance to, to these men who died and, and these, these things that happened. Men and women are small and bullets are put inside them. They lie down like stones, all the bodies lying on the ground. Like children throwing glass at rain, this could almost be strange new fun. Even when you are dead, gentlemen, no one will forget what you have done. That's the power of poetry, is that it, it cuts across time and space. It always exists and it can reverberate or resonate in different ways for different people at different moments in time. We've created those poems, they're still out there, and they're available again next time people want to go to war. We can remember what we did this time. People can go back, read those poems again, and be inspired to do, to do more. Maybe next time we'll succeed. Maybe next time we'll stop the war. The language of war is overt, mechanical, aggressive, out there. The language of poetry is inward. It's searching. It's tentative. It's, um, it's hopeful. And I think that's what makes uh, poetry a valid response at any time, but especially in the time of war. Poetry allows us to exist in uncertainty, that to heal as a result of listening to a poem doesn't mean that you sew everything up and it's all rosy and you feel consoled. It's, it's that you, you somehow are given strength to then exist with the uncertainty that anything could and might happen. So I can remember standing in the rain over a mud puddle and drinking this water the color of coffee, which was turning my own guts inside out, and seeing a young woman with her two small children drinking out of the same puddle. And I knew what that water had done to me and knew very well what that water would do to these kids. And I stood over them and recited in English, not a language anyone around me understood, W.H. Auden's Epitaph on a Tyrant, which is perfection of a kind was what he was after, and the poetry he invented was easy to understand. He knew human folly like the back of his hand, and was greatly interested in armies and fleets. When he laughed, respectable senators burst with laughter. And when he cried, the little children died in the streets.